Good morning. Everybody have your palm. All right. There, oh, this palm too. Yes, thank you, Barb. <laughs> All right. Let us gather ourselves for worship. I, I, this mic is not loud enough. I'm just going to have to get closer. Welcome to this time of worship. We join together, some in person and some virtually, and yet we are all in God's loving presence. If you are joining us online, please take a moment to gather something for communion later in the service. Crackers and water are perfectly acceptable. Today we continue with our special guest preachers, members of this congregation who have gifts and skills for speaking. Today we will hear from Mr. Earl Bush. As we focus ourselves for this gathering, let us remember this great gift that we have to worship together. Let us take this time to refresh our souls, to find spiritual nourishment in a hurting world, a time to refresh and renew our connection to one another and to God. Let us center ourselves with our prelude.
Welcome to Old South Church, United Church of Christ. Welcome to believers, to questioners, and to questioning believers. We gather in the hope of creating a safe space where you are free to risk being your authentic self. No matter how you identify or express your race, gender, or sexuality, you are welcome here. For this is God's house, and God welcomes all ages, colors, cultures, gifts, and abilities. Your presence here is a gift that challenges us to open our doors as wide as God's welcome. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcomed here by the God who made you and loved you just the way you are and loves you enough to challenge you to keep growing toward that person God made you to be, that together we may choose love and seek justice for all. We come to prepare for the holiest of weeks. We will journey through praise with joy we will travel through betrayal and death, cradling hope deep within our hearts. Jesus leads us through this week, and we will follow. For he is the life we long for. He is the example who sustains us. We wave palm branches in anticipation. We lay our love before him to cushion his walk. Setting aside all power, glory, and might, he comes, modeling humility and obedience for all of us. Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is the one who brings us the kingdom of God. Come, let us worship together. Please remain seated. Instead of our hymn this morning, we will be hearing from the choir.
Oh, no, I know. I just had to say that I was so moved. <laughs> okay. Okay. Now. Okay. My grandmother once said to us, you'll never know your true genius until you're willing to make a complete fool of yourself. <laughs> right? And so I can't think of a better group of people to be a fool for than you people. So we talk about the history. I want to talk about just what the energy was that was going through the people at that time. All right? So being a movie buff, and when I was a kid, I was in the movie. There was no separation. So keep this in mind. Greatest story ever told, 1965, in uh, 70-millimeter pan, uh, Panasculpt uh, film, high density, high resolution, Technicolor film, six channel Dolby surround sound, right? All right, scene from the Gospel of John, right? Jesus comes to Bethpage, finds out that Lazarus has died. The family is so overstraught, Jesus weeps for them and goes to the tomb to raise Lazarus up. Now, the, uh, the cemetery is filled with his followers and the pilgrims, and Max von Sydow goes, come forth, camera flashes back. You see everybody in the cemetery and this small white figure coming forward. Van Heflin, the skeptic, goes crazy and he goes, he is the Messiah, he is the Messiah. And he runs out to the road to Jerusalem telling everybody about that. Salminio, who was the cripple, sees what Van Heflin is doing and he runs after him going, it's true, it's true, it's true. And Edwin, you know, He's the man that he made Jesus, uh, Jesus made see, walking with his staff, because he's an old man, and people are coming up to him, what's going on, what's going on? And he's telling them what has just happened. So he's and this crowd are following them, and they're going down the road to, Peth, uh, to Jerusalem, and all of a sudden the camera angle changes, and now it's looking up the road from, uh, to, to the top of Mount Olive, and as Van Johnson comes running around, screaming, he's come, he's come, the Hallelujah Choir starts singing. You know, 110 orchestra, 200 member choir. And you're now starting to feel the music, right? And it's everywhere. And he's running down the hill as fast as he can, screaming, the Messiah's come, the Messiah's come. And every time Hallelujah is up, uh, is sung, a group of people stand up and go, what? And they've got this huge grin on their face and they go running after him, right? And all of a sudden, you see the camera panning down towards the gates of Jerusalem, the Golden Gates, which are still closed because it's too early to open. And there's a huge crowd there. And all of a sudden, Van Heflin just crashes into these people. And the camera looks down on him. And he's going, the Messiah's come. The Messiah's come. And then Salminio crashes into the group. And he's trying to swim through them like they serve. And then there's Edwin toddling down the hill with all these people behind him, all excited. And he goes crashing into this huge group. And at the last minute, they go shooting out of the front. Camera looks down at them. And you hear the Roman centurion say, what goes on here? And Van Heflin goes, the Messiah has come. He's raised a man from the dead. Hallelujah. And then so many who goes, I was crippled and he made me whole. Hallelujah. And then there's Edwin. He goes, and I was blind and he made me see. Hallelujah. Silence. Intermission. Cartoon. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. All the kids go running out and I'm just sitting there shaking. What just happened? I can't catch my breath. My heart's beating a minute. I'm still buzzing from the music. And then I realize my face is wet from tears. I was so overjoyed, so in the moment. Now, take that and multiply it by 300,000, which is the number of people they, they speculate were there that day. Then multiply that by a 1,000 years of oppression and in some cases, exile. And then multiply that by 500 years of a promise that someone was going to come and liberate you and set you free. And I think we begin to see just how ecstatic the people were that day.
reading this morning is from Matthew 21, verses 1 through 11. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this. The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet. Tell the daughter of Zion, look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them, they brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven." When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, who is this? The crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. And may we hear God's wisdom in this reading. Amen. Amen. Okay. So a Messiah had come. But what kind of Messiah? In the two months that I've been studying this, and Pastor Karen said, Earl, be prepared to go down a rabbit hole, and she was right, uh, there are all kinds of notions about who the Messiah was. But truthfully, in my 60 years of spiritual journey, right, it all comes down to this. It's about love. Right? Whatever I studied, whatever religion, whatever philosophies, it came down to this. It's about love and a very special kind of love, and one that you can find in the Bible, a love of loving kindness and compassion. All right? Just so, just so you know, think I'm taking you down a wild trail, Isaiah 54, 8, take, translated from the Hebrew. I hid my face for I was angry with you a bit, but now I see you, and all I have for you is hasad and racham. Hasad translates as loving kindness. Rakam translates as compassion, but it's a very interesting kind of compassion. It's not pity, it's not sympathy or empathy. The active definition is, your pain is my pain, your suffering is my suffering, your joys and concerns are mine as well. That's how close and intimate God is saying he is to us, right? And to just go a little bit further, he also says, as I made a covenant with Noah, to never bring another flood. I make a covenant with you to never be angry again. No matter what you do, I will keep my peace with you. So we're talking about a really loving God, all right? Now, we know, we know the story. You know, it's the three Ps, the preparation, the prophecy, and the procession. Well, I gave you a little hint on the procession. All right. But what you look at, and all these things that I was reading and listening to, uh, seems to form a, a particular kind of philosophy. When you look at the second section, the prophecy, right? people tie to the fact that Zechariah said that a king would come righteous and bringing salvation, will he? And they glom onto that, that therefore the kingdom, whatever it's going to be, their church, it's only for the righteous, and they are the only ones who are going to get saved. I mean, I heard so much of this, drawing that hard circle of like, who's in it and who's out of it, right? And those who are out of it are not to be trusted. No, they are unclean. They are condemned, and one pastor said, condemned to a life in hell. I don't think that's why Jesus came, but anyways, what happens is that there's separation. And I'm sitting there going like the litmus test. Is this about loving kindness and compassion and action? And the other part of it is, is 
do no harm to myself and to others. Why myself first? Because if I'm willing to hurt myself, no doubt I'm going to hurt somebody else. Right? So I'm sitting there going, no, that's not really the way. And quite frankly, that first part is part of my tradition, where by the middle of the sixth grade, I was so upset that, you know, one, I was only going to be able to go to heaven if I went to the right church, had the right communion, took the right sacraments, kept my soul spotless, and even if I did have a sin and I confessed it, it was still going to be there and have to spend time in purgatory, but all the people that didn't believe as me were not going to go. And I came home one day from mom and said, how come I have to hate so many people for Jesus to love me? I, I don't think that's why Jesus came. The second group looks at the first section, you know, that especially the term, especially where Jesus says, if anyone should ask, let them know, the, let, tell them the Lord has need of it. Now, Jesus never referred to, referred to himself as Lord. Therefore, he's, when he refers to Lord, he's talking about God. So God has need for Jesus to ride the donkey. But why? Well, in this case, they're saying that God has chosen Jesus to be the unblemished lamb to be sacrificed. Just like at the temple, they would find an unblemished lamb, sacrifice it, and the blood of the lamb would protect the Jewish people. God would accept the offering and his blessing would come down upon him. So that's what they look at Jesus being. All right? And in fact, they talk about it being washed in the sacred blood of Jesus. For Jesus' blood was spilled to wipe away the sins of the world. All right? Now, what I see happening so much there, and especially and some of the videos in my experiences is that in order to be close to God, you have to suffer as Jesus suffered. I'm so no, I don't think so. I mean, my 13-year-old Earl said, I don't think so. But again, these people are fervent in their belief. And in fact, we even had a session a few weeks ago where they talked about making sure that you're not trying to put yourself up on the cross. That's not why Jesus came. And, and there are some people, I have to tell you, there's some things really beautiful about it. Like when Santa Fe, when I walked on the pilgrimage with friends and their families, from Santa Fe to Chumayo, where the sanctuario, where the holy dirt is, where if you rub it on yourself, whatever ails you will be, be miraculously gone. Well, Holy Week, people come from all over. So we walked two days from Santa Fe to Chumayo, set up camp, and then Good Friday came that morning. You fast all day, but when we got to the village, there were people carrying crosses, crowns of thorns, whipping themselves or being whipped, and then being put up on the cross. And I'm sitting back going like, I understand the fervent of their belief, but is this why Jesus came? And I have to say, I don't think so. Right? Good for you, not for me. Right? I don't see how it's love in action. But there's another way, and it came from a very odd place, and that is the loving and humble servant. Right? That I can connect with. Right? And the way it came to me is by a teacher that I had in Santa Fe, Lama Dorje. When I was getting ready to come back and take care of Charlie and Mom and trying to find a, a, a teacher here, a spiritual teacher here, not having much luck, he said to me, Lama Dorje, why are you not Christian? I said, well, and I went into my diatribe and he was, oh, 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 oh. Why would you expect anybody to give up their prejudices and biases if you aren't willing to give up your own? Didn't your Jesus say, love everybody? Like, I love them, love everybody. I went, oh. And he says, and remember, even the most hateful person loves something, and that's where you must begin. Jesus say that too. He a good teacher. Oh, and so I sat there for a minute, and I finally said to him, Lama Dorji, what do you think about Jesus? And this is what he said. Face went serene. Tears were welling up in his eyes. And he went, he took on the karma of the whole world so that we might see ourselves clearly, that we are connected to God, for God is within us, and we are also connected to each other, so that one person's pain is our pain. One person's suffering is our suffering. We are there with them because we are them. I went, oh. So when I came back to Cleveland, I started looking for that practice. Now, 
Let's look at the life of Jesus for those three years in Galilee before he becomes prophet, Messiah, and Christ. Right? Everything he did was about bringing us closer to each other. I mean, when you think about the Sermon on the Mount, you know, chapters 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew, I mean, everything he's doing, he's, he's entreating us to be connected to each other. You know, blessed are the meek, humble at heart, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they are much loved by God. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall feel mercy. Right? Birds in the sky, lilies of the field. You know, if someone takes a shirt, give them your coat. Right? Turn the other cheek. Love your enemy. Right? And the one I especially love is that help the needy and do it humbly without trumpet. Right? Now that's very close to the Buddhist thing. It's like, look, when you're helping somebody, first of all, thank them. For they are trusting you to care for them. What a blessing is that to have somebody trust you. And second, do it humbly so that you realize that you are, you know, there's equanimity. You aren't up here and they're down there. You're equal in helping them because they are helping you move forward on your path. So they are a blessing, not a curse, not a burden. Right? And of course, we can go into the parables, but the two that I really like, and I have to, I want, because I'm an attorney, right? And we have attorneys in the room here, is that the one attorney, the uh, temple attorney who says to Jesus, is it a sin to, uh, to per uh, perform a miracle on the Sabbath? And Jesus says, is it a sin to do good or evil? Is it a sin to save a life or kill? The lawyer was silent, and Jesus says, yo, if you are doing good, even if it's against the law, it is a sin. Ethics. Just because you can do something, even have the right to do it, doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. Do the right thing. And the other one is, what do I have to, be, what do, I have to do in order to be a righteous man? And Jesus says, love God with all your heart and all your soul, which I'm sure their lawyer would have liked to have stopped there. But then he says, and love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, if you, all you do is follow the law, the 613 mitzvahs, commandments from God, but you don't love your neighbor, it's for naught. And Paul later, when asked, what do I have to do? He says, love your neighbor as yourself. And the person comes back and says, well, what about God? He says, if you are loving your neighbor as yourself, you are loving God. Right? So the question then becomes, how do we put this loving kindness and compassion into action while making sure we don't harm ourselves and others. That's next time. <laughs> All right? If you'll have me talk again, and that's up to you, that's next time how we'll do it. But what I want to do right now, because this is very important to me, is I want to leave you with an affirmation and a blessing. The affirmation is something that I've been holding intentionally while I've been talking to you today. And here it goes. Uh, wouldn't you know the heart shooter would be right where the speed mic is? Okay. I feel warm and loving towards each of you. For each of you is a precious and unique being. Ever doing the best your current awarenesses permit. Ever growing in wisdom and love. Oh God, I get choked up when I do that. Ever growing in wisdom and love. And the blessing, may you always feel God's loving kindness and compassion within you, for it is always there. And may your hearts be open enough that God's love can flow through you into a world much in need. Amen. Part two is April 30th, if you want to mark your calendars. <laughs>
<laughs> he kept telling me he was practicing with his timer, so, okay. Oh, thank you. We come to a moment uh, for gratitude for our many blessings, for this community of faith, for the people who faithfully gather here, for God's movement in our lives, for God's continuing presence in our midst. We respond to these great gifts by sharing a portion of our time, talents, and treasure with others. Thank you for all you do to keep this church moving forward. May the gifts received by this community of faith be used with wisdom and compassion. need a whole service of that that's what I'm saying <laughs> uh, let us pray God whose giving knows no ending we offer up the treasure that you have entrusted to us 
We offer up the skills and time that you have graciously given to us. We offer up ourselves in service and praise. Receive these gifts by your grace. Multiply and use them through the power of the Holy Spirit to accomplish Jesus' work of love in the world. Amen. We come to a time of sharing our joys and our concerns. Do we have a mic? Yeah. Not only am I doing the streaming, I'm Jackson this morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would be... And I'm not going to run. <laughs> uh, we do have a um, prayer request from the online crowd from Jennifer. It's peaceful and safe Ramadan to our Muslim community. Thank you. Anybody else? So I wanted to say I'm delightful that the Community Church of Chesterland was able to have their events yesterday with no violence, yes. in spite of the people. The, I know that the, the uh, law enforcement people were very concerned, but I think Jess was right in keep continuing to get the uh, do the events. Thank so, you. Praise for that. Sadly, though, Pilgrim UCC in Cuyahoga Falls had their part of their roof blown off. This is a church that also has had the steeple hit twice by lightning. <laughs> <laughs> so they're not having a great time. But they, 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 a man was on the news this morning and said they called the insurance company, got their claim number, now those just move on. So yes. we have a resilient crowd. Yes. Ah, ha, ha. Yep. Prayers for my good friend Aaron Patterson, who's going in for foot surgery this Friday. Thank you. I guess I would add uh, prayers for my brother and his wife. Uh, a week from now on Monday, uh, his wife is having um, back surgery. And so I may or may not be here next Sunday, so I wanted to get that in because I'm going to Kentucky to help them out. Prayers for comfort and peace. Uh, and transition for Terry's cousin Karen uh, who is going to be heading into hospice uh, she is uh, battling cancer okay. so. thank you <laughs> oh my goodness <laughs> prayers for the family of Pat um, I forget her name, but she's she works with me, mm. and she she worked with me, and she died on Friday. Oh, thank you. For my friend Alicia Boyd, who passed on Friday from pancreatic cancer. Okay, thank you. It's a joy of mine. I just recently discovered. I'll learn to do this Sunday. <laughs> I just discovered a grief group at uh, hospice. Speaking of hospice, that I was belonging to uh, the first meeting last Wednesday. And uh, since I lost Sylvia, there are a lot of other things that are going on. And these people, ten of us, ten of us, I think, ten or twelve. And we share similar situations. And I remember Pastor Karen a couple of years ago had Sylvia and I and Jennifer, Brenda, and Judy yeah. in uh, her group, which really benefited me a lot. So the joy is there are groups of people out there. I thank God for hospice because it's a really good thing mm -hmm. that they're doing for me and others. I'm just going to give a shout out to Kevin and Allie because, um, <clears throat> sorry, my voice is raspy. Um, what they've done downstairs in the Sunday school is really, really amazing. 
And if you haven't been down there, you really need to get down there and see it. I volunteered down there a couple weeks ago. They need volunteers, because I remember when I had kids. Honestly, I love my kids to this day, but when I came to church, I didn't want to also be downstairs with them. So if you can help out down there, please do, because I, I think all of us remember those days, and it is important. But Kevin, you've done an awesome job down there. And you continue to. So I yes. hope that you continue to get our support. Amen. Amen. I'd just like to give a little shout out to the men and women who were out last night making repairs after the storm. Yes. And hope that they continue to be safe. Thank you. Yes. Yes, that was pretty windy yesterday. Lots of damage in lots of places. Are we good? Okay, let us gather those things which were shared aloud and those things which we have kept in our hearts. Let us take a few moments and give our attention to the holy mystery that dwells within us. First with song and then with a moment of holy stillness, please remain seated. God, on this holy day of Palm Sunday and Passion, we have so many mixed feelings inside of us. We remember your son's triumphant entrance into Jerusalem with the people shouting praises and waving palm branches. And we join them with our own praise, and yet we remember, too, that this wonderful parade for your son becomes another kind of parade before officials and the booing crowds. And instead of the crowd singing his praises, they are shouting to crucify him. And our hearts are broken by those very shouts and the pain and suffering he bore that day. And yet we know that it is because of his choosing to enter Jerusalem and taking the path he knew he was taking. There is hope, grace, love, and renewal for all. And there are still many in need of hope in our world. There are still many in need of your grace in our world. There are still many in need of your love in our world. And there are still many in need of renewal in our world. Lord, enter our lives, our churches, our cities, our countries once again today. Heal us, Lord. Transform us. Renew us. Draw us closer to you in this journey of Holy Week. Empower us with strength and courage and with the assurance that you are with us. We offer these prayers and the prayers of our hearts in the name of Jesus, our brother, our teacher, and redeemer, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our communion table is an open table. We are all welcome at God's banquet. Whether you believe a little 
or a lot, whether you have been baptized or not, whether you are a long-time member or a first-time visitor, whether this ritual has deep meaning for you or you are seeking to find God in a new way, we invite you to God's table of love. We use grape juice, and there are two types of bread. The gluten-free bread is in a wrapper, and the rest is wheat-based. We will take the elements together, so please hold them until we all take them together. Let us share in God's holy meal. Earl, I need that mic. I'm sorry. Earl. <laughs> Holy mystery, source of life, living spirit, you are creatively and generously moving. In all the near and distant corners of the universe, nothing exists that does not find its source in you. Even when we turn away from you, you are with us. Your presence never fails us. Your gifts of hope and new life transform us. We praise you for Jesus, who demonstrated your eternal love and reminded us of our bond to one another. We rejoice with all of your people in every time and proclaim your presence in our lives. It is Jesus who joins us together as a community of hopeful believers, loving what he loved, living what he taught, and striving to be his faithful servants in our time and place. In this meal, we remember Jesus, his promises, and the price he paid for who he was, what he said, and what he did. On the night before Jesus died, he took a loaf of bread. He gave thanks, he broke it, and said, take and eat. This is the bread of life. Whenever you do this, remember me. After supper, Jesus took the cup and poured, saying, This is the new covenant. Remember me. We do remember. We remember his life of love, his friendship, his teaching, his dying, and his rising to new life again. Holy mystery, spirit of love, our creator, we call to you to transform these similar things as you continually transform the world around us. Bless this bread and this cup, the wheat and the grape, the farmer and the harvest, the seed and the sower. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Bless this bread and bless this fruit of the vine. Bless all of us in our eating and drinking that our eyes might be open, that we might recognize you in our midst, indeed, in one another. Come, Holy Spirit, come.
the symbol of the bread, we find hope for a better world and dedicate ourselves to listening for the new ways God may be calling us. Take and eat. the symbol of the cup, we find holy love and dedicate ourselves to follow where God's spirit leads. Take and drink. Let us pray. Creator God, we give you thanks for the grain farmers, the bread bakers, the grape growers, the juice makers. Redeemer God, we give you thanks for all that we remember as we have shared this meal. We remember your birth, your life, your death, and new life. Sustaining God, we give you thanks for the eternal presence of your spirit with us, surrounding us and filling us with divine love. May this meal we have shared renew us and inspire us to join more fully with you as you work for peace and justice in the world. Amen.
And speaking for justice, we will now have our witness for justice moment. Good morning. Today we conclude our study of the way of abundance, economic justice in scripture and society. And there's really a lot more in here than we were able to share. Um, but we hope that we've encouraged you to think about our economy. Creating a just economy is not something we can do alone, but we can have input. We can choose economic policies, institutions and structures designed to achieve economic justice and reasonably expect to move forward toward that goal. Today we look at how we can apply the biblical history we have been learning about in the past month to guide our choices to provide abundance for all. First, everyone thrives. Biblical writers did not recognize human rights as we view them today, but biblical law does include key components of economic human rights. The teachings recognized that everyone deserved and was entitled to a fair share of God's abundance. Society was obligated to alleviate poverty. The poor had rights to food. Workers had a right to livelihood, land, or a job that paid a living wage. People today need the following economic rights. Job, housing, health care, education, economic security, and earnings sufficient to provide for a family's food, clothing, and recreation. Second, jobs and living wages for all. Biblical writers teach a just economy depends on a two-way commitment that everyone receives the material resources needed and everyone has work and contributes their talents to build the common good. Here are some key, key goals we can add, with, that, which can aid in providing jobs and living wages for all. Unions so workers can propose and discuss improvements to the workplace. Minimum wage raised to a living wage that will support a family. Prohibit non-compete agreements in employee contracts. Eliminate current barriers which keep the courts from settling disputes. Increase manufacturing in the United States and break up mega corporations. Third, sustainability. Sustainability requires working for improvements for all people, not just those in the United States. The goal is economic growth that promotes human development, expanding the richness of human life rather than the richness of economy. In conclusion, the way of abundance proposes no particular economic system. Whatever our type of economic system, our faith requires it to be organized and run with the purpose of achieving universal thriving through living wage jobs that affirm workers' dignity and with protections and support for those who find themselves on the margin. In two weeks, we will continue our study of justice in the marketplace by beginning a study of globalization at what price by Pamela K. Brubaker. Thank you very much. We come to a time for some announcements. Um, I'll start while our mic comes down the steps. Um, the Saving Jesus video continues today. Each video stands alone, and after watching that 30-minute video, we will share our thoughts. We'll meet at 11.30 in the Fishes and Loaves room. Today at 5, we have our social hour Zoom. And now... Okay, I'll start out uh, with just a quick announcement. Um, you may have noticed as you came in this morning, we, we have a uh, security camera now at the south entrance. Uh, as a result of all that's been going on, we thought we could help to put up a camera. So it's there, and it, uh, hopefully if something happens, we'll have some video of it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It won't prevent, but it could help monitor. Anybody else? Um, just a couple announcements on the open house. So I, I don't have a sign-up sheet yet in the anchor lamp room, but. You know, some people have gotten back to me as far as when they'll be here and what they'll cover. Um, I, I think we're going to keep it fairly informal, so you know, feel free to come in. Uh, I think we'll have the anchor lamp room just set up kind of like it is now. Um, we'll have coffee and whatnot there. Um, and
and then um, you know people want to come and sit and socialize there. Well, you know as people come through, um, you know and interact with anybody that comes through. Um, we'll have some greeters and uh, we'll take people around in the sanctuary. Uh, the choir will be rehearsing for a portion of that time. Then we'll have music. Um, people will come in here to check it out as well. Um, and then probably you know some volunteers down in the nursery and Christian Ed area. And then depending on the weather, um, you know, people want, you know, are interested in taking people out to yep. the Dell and kind of or to the food pantry. If, I don't know. I haven't connected with Bill yet, but uh, if you want to have anybody over there and have it open for people to stop over. Um, and then the, one thought that occurred to me is, um, you know, there's, I think it's 11 churches that are participating in the area. I don't know if, any, you know, if anybody's interested in checking out the other churches. Uh, the pickup, I think, is at City Hall. Is that where the envelopes will be? Um, then you'll have a map of the churches as well. Um, as, as long as you come back here. Yes, yeah, so come back here. <laughs> Yes. See some other people that are touring and yes. tell them they're from Old South. There you go. <laughs> um, Thank you. Uh, we're working on a pamphlet, a trifold pamphlet. Um, Jennifer Lipster has put a draft together. Me and Emily are reviewing it and we'll add some stuff. Um, I'd suggest updating, you know, keep your bulletin boards updated. And I think that's it. If you have any questions, you can text me or email. Thank you. Fena. I just wanted to say that there is a movie this week at uh, the Regal Cinema and, and by the mall, um, His Only Son. I went and saw it and I recommend everybody go see it. It's only this week only. And there's a lot of food for thought when you watch it. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> go for it, Gene. He, you make him walk? Okay, Most that's fair. Most exercise I've had in weeks. <laughs> I just want to remind everyone, there's still time to order an Easter loy if you'd like to. Um, you can order it today. I'll be over in uh, Anchor Ramp Room. And, um, okay. We can add this to the joys. Sorry, it's my father's 81st birthday today. All right. <laughs> Happy birthday, Al. Right. Okay, so uh, Good Friday is this Friday. Um, we have the sign-up on the bulletin board in the hallway from 9 to 3 for a vigil here in the worship space. We're asking people to sign up for 30 minutes. But if you are unable to make a commitment to a specific time, feel free to come by at any time. Um, there will be something for you to read and reflect on and write some answers to some questions if you feel like it or not. Just sit in quiet. Anything you'd like to do, you are welcome to come and do. Did I miss any? Next Sunday's Easter, folks. I get to preach. <laughs> Let us stand together to sing our closing hymn, number 223.
we came waving palms joyfully, welcome, welcoming Jesus. We depart knowing the week ahead will be difficult, but we are ever hopeful. And now go forth from this place holding on to God's love for you, remembering to offer patience and kindness to all you meet. Let the Spirit guide your steps, and may we always live with hope, peace, joy, love, and seek justice. Amen.